Hi, and welcome to another episode of Unstoppable Mindset, where inclusion, diversity, and the unexpected meet. And there's a reason I'm saying that, because I just discovered that our guest today and my mother, her maiden name anyway, is the same, and she lives in the Chicago area, and my mother lived in the Chicago area for a long time. So, Heather Stone, welcome to Unstoppable Mindset. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. We could we could probably go back and compare notes further because before they lived in Chicago, um, my mother and her her family lived in New York, I think in Brooklyn. Oh, my family also was in New York before they came to Chicago. This is getting scarier. So, everyone, there is a mystery to solve. <laughs> uh, my par- my grandfather came from. Warsaw through Paris, then to New York, and eventually Chicago. There you go. Um, and the only thing none of us can ever find that we have is a link to Garrett of Garrett's Popcorn, so we still have to pay for it. <laughs> well, Heather is uh, an expert on disability and inclusion studies. And we're going to get into that. But why don't you start now that we've given some of our history? Why don't you tell us a little bit about you? Sure. Well, um, once again, my name is Heather Stone. Um, I have a PhD in disability studies from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, My experience with disability is interesting, as it is for most people. Um, I did not know I was visually impaired until I was 15. So I never remember seeing a chalkboard in school at all. I have no memory. Um, But when my parents would take me to the eye doctor, um, there was nothing that he could detect at the time. So, you know, he mentioned to my parents, well, she might just be kind of exaggerating to get attention. So as my life progressed, um, I was a terrible student. I was getting in lots of trouble um, and I couldn't see. So it wasn't until I failed the vision test for my driver's permit um, that my parents really became alarmed. And at that time we revisited the family ophthalmologist Um, and he said, oh, you know, I I got this new piece of equipment and, you know, I don't know if it's going to be effective for you. It's usually just for older people who have, you know, this disease, macular degeneration. This test is called the field of vision. Let's just put her on it. You know, let's just see what happens. And lo and behold, it, it revealed that I had two central blind spots in both eyes. Um, I was then referred, my family was referred to Dr. Gerald Fishman, who I think at this point is still the the world leading retinologist, although he's retired now, um, just so happened to be at UIC. And so I was referred to him. um, And then I was diagnosed with Stargardt's macular dystrophy when I was 15. That certainly uh, had to be a shock. How did your parents deal with that? I mean, it was a shock to all of us. Um, It answered a lot of questions. It put a lot of things into perspective. Um, You know, it was, and I mean, to this day, it's troubling for my parents who are, you know, educated people living in the suburbs of Chicago with lots of resources. And still with all of those circumstances, um, my diagnosis was delayed so long, and this had like major consequences for my life. Um, you know, everyone was telling me there's nothing wrong with you, but yet I couldn't see anything. And they were, they said there was nothing wrong with my vision. So, you know, as a, as a young person, as a teenager, I was like, well, I guess I'm just stupid. You know, I couldn't come up or crazy. I couldn't come up with why I couldn't see and why nobody believed me. Um, So in getting the diagnosis, 
it was, um, you know, it justified a lot of things. And it, I had a big chip on my shoulder because I realized that the problem wasn't that I was stupid or crazy, that there was a physical, biological problem going on. And I had been right. Um, and I realized not only was I not stupid, I think I was kind of smart, you know? There you go. There you go. <laughs> I, and I, and I, um, you know, we contacted the, the high school and this was, I think in 1992 and they let us know, well, you're lucky because this new law, the Americans with Disabilities Act was just passed two years ago. And this is going to be really great for you because it mandates, you know, equal access to an, to an education. And at that point I was like, okay, you know, give me the material in a way I can see it and let me show you what I can do. And I enrolled in AP and F accelerated courses. I got A's. I took the AP exams. I got a five on the AP European history test, uh, five, and that's the highest score you could get, five on the AP English. Um, I, and I passed one other AP test, which made me an AP scholar. Um, I did really well on the ACT because I was able to take it in large print with a little extended time. Um, I set my sight on going to Brandeis University in Boston. Um, I was accepted early admission and um, I had, I mean, college is just the best. And <laughs> I had such a wonderful time um, at Brandeis and uh, you know, um, pursued academia um, as far as I as I could. Um, I eventually did my master's degree at the University of Chicago um, in the Master's of Arts program in the social sciences, um, and that was a really good opportunity for me to take courses throughout the social sciences. Uh, I had been a sociology and African and African American studies major at Brandeis. Um, and I was really, I was glad to have this opportunity to take sociology, psychology, anthropology courses. And I realized I didn't want to get my PhD in any of those. The only thing I wanted to get my PhD in was at UIC in disability studies. And, you know, there's, there are circles, these patterns in our life. And the fact that I, I, I keep returning to UIC through all these different circles. And um, if you know the history of the, of, the, of the school, you know that it was once called the Circle Campus. So <laughs> I, I enjoy uh, the cyclical nature of my visits to the University of Illinois. Um, and I graduated with my PhD from UIC uh, 2016, and um, that was very exciting. So you um, you went you you spent a significant amount of time from well high school 1992. So what year did you graduate? From high from what high school? <laughs> 1995. Okay, so from. High school, it was 21 years to get a PhD. So you certainly, uh, well, maybe you were, but you certainly probably weren't a student that entire time in terms of specifically being enrolled. You must have had some jobs or, or were you a professional student? <laughs> um, you know, I, I have always tried to maintain a balance between um, the ivory tower and actual real world practice. Um, so soon after I was diagnosed with Stargardt's, um, I got a job when I was about 16 at a, at a summer camp um, working. It was a, a typical summer camp, but my job was to be a one-on-one -on -one assistant for a child with a disability and facilitate his integration into the group. So um, my first encounter with someone who had autism was this little boy, Daniel, um, who was five years old going into kindergarten. And, you know, my job was to make sure that he had a fabulous time at camp. 
And um, I just, I instantly um, identified with him, connected with him, um, just became so intrigued by him and his family and this thing called autism. Um, and, you know, it was really interesting because I, I had co-counselors and they were running things for the main group and they would routinely forget about my camper, Daniel. And I would have to open my big mouth and, you know, make sure that he was getting treated fairly and that what every other camper was getting was open to him as well. And I feel like that was critical for me to learn advocacy skills for myself. Because at that time, I, you know, a year and a half into knowing that I had this vision impairment um, and getting accommodation in school, the problem was that my teachers always forgot that I'm visually impaired. And in fact, I like to joke that one of my biggest barriers is that I pass so easily and people forget all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, my, even my, my parents, like my best friends, like everyone, I think the only people who don't forget are probably my kids because they've had to deal with it their whole life. Um, you know, so, I pass so easily that people forget to make the accommodation. And, you know, later in my life, it's like, I want the white cane just so people stop forgetting, you know, like I don't necessarily need it to get around at this point, but I'm tired of having to remind people all the time that I can't see. So you are considered legally blind. Oh, yes. Oh, so, yeah. you know, the, the only thing I would say is, you never know when you need it or don't. And I agree with you that it, it, it's important to carry it and use it because then people know, although it has its pluses and its minuses concerning how people treat you. But the other side of it is it's the one thing that you don't see that your cane would detect that could make the whole difference. What do you and mean? well, OK, so, for example, one of my favorite stories is about a guy who was losing his eyesight in New Jersey. And I think I've told this story a couple of times on the podcast. And he would go every day into Philadelphia from across the river in New Jersey <clears throat> and he'd go to work. So he got um, it was discovered that he was losing his eyesight. And I don't recall what the reason was, but he went to the New Jersey Commission for the Blind, and he, among other things, was given a cane. And they said, but we really think you need to use your eyes as much as you can. And they didn't really emphasize the cane, but they said, you know, you really should start to learn to use it at some point. And so he carried it with him, but he didn't always use it. And one day he was going to board a train to go across the river, and he was walking along the train. It was a sort of a cloudy day. Um, he got to the place where he was supposed to turn in and, and enter the train. And he turned and stepped into the train, except he didn't step into the train. He stepped into the space between two train cars because oh, wow. he wasn't seeing well enough to realize that that wasn't the entrance to the train, whereas his cane would have found it. And the train began to move, but they did stop it. And they, they got him up and he went on into the train at the right place and went into Philadelphia. But he has told that story and said emphatically, and that's why I always from then on used a cane. And so that's why I say that it's the one time that you don't see something that you normally would if you had full eyesight, but that your cane would find that makes all the difference. Right. You know, and if people are going to be obnoxious and rude, you could just weaponize the cane like Daredevil and, you know, take them down. I'm just kidding. Well, you could, you know, and, <laughs> and shove them between the cars. You know, like, I'll show you. Um, <laughs> but I'll but it you. is. Yeah. But, but yeah, it is. It is an issue. And the cane is the most basic tool. And, and it is true that oftentimes people misassess what blind people can and can't do. And that's unfortunate. I, I hate the term disability, but I don't have another one. Um, I don't like differently abled because we're not. We have the same abilities. 
we we utilize different tools to get there. So I haven't really found a better term, um, but that's okay. People have warped in uh, diversity so that it doesn't include disabilities. So disability can be warped just as well and be a positive thing. Absolutely. I mean, I see it as a point of pride. You know, I'm proud to tell people that I'm that I'm disabled and that I'm an advocate for people with disabilities. Um, you know, I've always tried to uh, recognize the people at the margin of our society and who who isn't being treated equally or fairly. Um, and I feel like people with disabilities are often, you know, left out of the of the conversation about diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, and you know, I, I feel like people with disabilities really have the greatest struggle to get equal rights at this point. Um, but you know. This early connection I had um, with this child with autism and advocating for him gave me some of those early skills to advocate for myself um, and gave me a sense of, of this cross disability connection and pride. And, you know, though he was autistic and I was blind, I could identify with his inability to make eye contact, for example. Like there are consequences if you don't, if you can't make eye contact or if it's difficult, um, you know, the concept of neurodiversity, which is a huge, um, uh, a, a huge philosophy movement um, coming from the autistic community. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, a celebration of the fact that like there's diversity within our biology, there's diversity within our, our neurology. And these are things that make life more interesting, more nuanced, more textured. And, you know, it's not all bad that there is a lot of constructive, productive, positive things that I've learned from being disabled. The bad is usually what people make it, as opposed to it being real. Um, this whole idea that it's bad to be a person with a disability, it's bad to be blind. And blindness has been cited by the Gallup polling organization as in the past, one of the top five fears we face, not disabilities, but blindness. Mm -hmm. it's, it's all perception as opposed to reality. Yeah, and in this case, it's literally perception. It is literally <laughs> perception. You know, yeah. I, um, I, have, I think words matter, and I've st actually started rejecting using the term visually impaired because visually we're not different. You don't change your appearance simply because you go blind, and we talk about visual things. We're not visually impaired. Um, I don't like vision impaired a whole lot, but I'll use vision impaired and when people use it, I, I encourage that because I think it's more relevant. In reality, I think I have lots of vision. And as I say to people, I just don't see so good. But, you know, um, but the reality is vision impairment is, is a lot more of an accurate term than visually impaired. And words matter because that tends to, to denigrate us in ways that it doesn't need to happen or be. Absolutely. I mean, Blindness is historically and metaphorically linked with lack of knowing, lack of knowledge. I mean, we could come up with about a million different colloquial terms that are completely contingent on the concept of blindness, you know, blind faith, uh, you know, blind you justice, know, uh, you know, like we could sit getting robbed blind, you know, we can sit here and go through a million of it, a million different you know, term. Um, and, you know, I, I agree that that words do matter. And there's a lot of political implication mm -hmm. to these words, um, which is when things get, you know, real kind of sticky and tricky. Um, you know, I was talking to someone recently. And, you know, I, I was I described myself 
as, you know, you know, I'm a blind woman. And this person said, well, you know, you're not a blind woman. You're a woman who has a visual impairment. Have you heard of person first language? And I was like, well, I do have a PhD in disability studies. So yes, I am familiar with that concept. And there are so many disabled people who just reject that like person first, like really do I need to remind you that I'm a person? Like I'm I'm okay saying like I'm blind in the same right. way I'm I'm okay saying I'm a Jew. I'm not a person who has Judaism, you know, I'm not a person who has blindness. I'm a blind Jew and it's okay. Right. And it isn't a you know and again it isn't a visual impairment. It's a vision impairment because visually um we don't we don't look different. Um, there are some things that can make some of us different, but that's true with anyone. But we we cling to stuff, and sometimes we don't grow like we really should, which is unfortunate. Yeah, and you know, I always say that you know, you, you any given situation you can look at as a tragedy or as an opportunity. You know there there is a silver lining i am a compulsive silver lining finder um almost it's almost a problem uh, but you know there life is is really a matter of perspective um when i was first diagnosed doctors told me that it was most likely i would never drive so i thought okay i won't drive and you know i thought about how that would affect me and i thought about how my mom had driven me to preschool and I wanted to know how am I going to drive my kids to preschool? Um, and am I going to even be able to find someone who's going to want to marry me or have kids with me? Like, I don't know anything about this blindness. I'm new to this whole game. And it was always the actual physical losing my sight was never as difficult as the social ramifications of the shift in identity because I was raised as an able-bodied person. And then during my adolescent years, it was, guess what? You have this new identity. And it's this very stigmatized identity that people, like you said, there are, people are fearful about losing their vision. Um, and, you know, I didn't really, I couldn't foresee what would happen. Um, but one of these circles came around for me. I was recruited by a study at UIC, once again, to use telescopic lenses um, to get a driver's license. Huh. So um, after about two years of intensive occupational therapy and uh, assorted other interventions, um, I got a driver's license. And when I was 20 years old, and I drove until I was 42. So, you know, I was able to drive my kids to preschool, except my daughter's final year. Um, and I knew that that annual vision test was coming around, which I had to take to keep my, my restricted daylight only license. Um, and I knew that I wasn't gonna pass and that I had probably been on the cusp for a while. And, you know, I was like, let me, I'm going to decide that I'm just, I'm going to stop driving at the end of this month and that's going to be it. Um, and, you know, it was scary. I, I, you know, not driving anymore after having had it for so long, I was really scared. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that I've really coped really well with not driving. Um, you know, it really, it, it hasn't been as bad as I thought it was going to be. Um, so how long ago was it that you gave up driving? So that was um, about three years ago. See how easily we adapt. <laughs> now you're, now you're somewhat used to it and you can um, get people to drive you around again. You know, I've, um, <laughs> I, I'm working with getting more comfortable with public transportation, yeah. um, doing lift. 
um, reaching out to friends. You know, um, I have I have a friend who is bipolar and is on disability and doesn't work. So he, I hired him to be my driver. There you and, go. you know, and the, it's one of my one of my favorite concepts coming from disability studies is the concept of interdependence, which I'm sure you can relate to. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, you do this and I'll do that and we're going to work together and we're going to get it done. Mahatma Gandhi once said, interdependence is and ought to be just as much the ideal of man as is self-sufficiency. And it's one of my favorite quotes and a very accurate one that more people really ought to pay attention to. I mean, that is so, so true and so valid. Absolutely. In reality, if we really look at things, we're all interdependent on each other. We just like to think we're not, but it doesn't work that way. And Absolutely. it's it's really important that we do more, I think, to recognize the validity and value of interdependence. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I reject independence. I reject codependence. <laughs> um, but interdependence is a beautiful thing. And, yeah. you know, I think that is really, you know, the core of diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, right. We're social animals. We need each other. Um, you know, if, if it, living through this pandemic is is improved, um, we need we need each other. Yeah, and living through this pandemic, if if that doesn't show us that, then we're really missing it. Absolutely. And so, and you know, we uh, look at. Look at the things that we've learned. More and more companies are now recognizing that there is value in letting people do at least some of their work at home. Better mindset, better lifestyles, and the work still gets done. Absolutely. You know, mental health matters. And, you know, um, the Protestant work ethic you know, isn't as valid in 2022, you know, like, we can be a little bit more flexible in our scheduling and the way we approach work. Or we should be anyway. Absolutely. So you have a very positive view of blindness and an outlook on on life and so on. Who has affected you and who kind of has influenced your, your view of blindness and, and influenced the way you are? Oh, my. Uh, I mean, my parents are just so supportive of me, um, always encouraged me to just go after what whatever I wanted to pursue. Um, you know, even when other people looked at them <laughs> sideways or, you know, uh, questioned what they were doing. Um, I'm an incredible downhill skier uh, in my teenage years. My parents' friends are like, are you, you know, have you lost it? I still, to this day, I'm a great skier. Um, I was a varsity diver. Uh, I, um, you know, I decided that I wanted to go to Brandeis. My parents backed me up. They made it happen. Um, you know, so they, they never, I, I was never fearful. Um, you know, and it's also sort of just like, just my natural personality. Um, and I am a very small, petite person. Um, and I'm also blind. So if I don't open my mouth and speak up, I might get bulldozed. Uh, so I'm just used to just opening my mouth and saying it like it is and not being afraid. Um, and, you know, to pursue the things that I want. When I was 20, uh, or 22, um, I decided that I wanted to go backpacking through Thailand. So me and my best friend, who eventually became an eye surgeon, ironically enough, uh, we went to Thailand for a month. We went backpacking. We trekked through the jungle. We slept in a hut on stilts. And the next morning, elephants were waiting outside our, our, our little you know, fort thing 
And we rode elephants through the jungle to the next village that we were going to stay in. You know, so whatever it is that you want to do, you can do it. Um, and all the things that I've wanted to accomplish, I've been able to find a way to do it. And, um, you know, like it, I, I get in where I fit in and I go where the, where the climate suits my clothes, you know? So if, uh, if it's not working one way, there's about a million other ways you can try to do it. And if you shift your perspective, a lot of opportunity may open up. Um, you know, when I tell people that I don't drive anymore, well, oh my goodness, how do you, how do you get to the grocery store? I'm like, um, there's about a million different <laughs> companies that deliver groceries at this point. I've always hated grocery shopping. So why do it? Like, you know, I have a PhD. I, I wrote a book. I have all these skills. Like, what do you need to drive? Like a pulse, a heartbeat and some decent vision, you know, like, uh, I don't, it's not necessary. It's all a matter of, of perspective. Of course, it'd be nice if you did have an elephant to ferry you around. That'd be fun. <laughs> I'm not sure that that would go over in my, my, yeah. my North Shore suburb, but. Um, <laughs> and, and the food and the food bill would, would probably be a little tough, but uh, that's okay. I don't, I don't think my HOA would appreciate the elephant on the property. Tell them to think in broader strokes. Change, change the mindset. I, um, I, I agree with you, especially during the pandemic. Um, as I love to say, Instacart and Grubhub are our friends, and uh, we use them a lot. My wife drives. <clears throat> she uses a wheelchair, but she drives. But especially during the pandemic, we have chosen not to go out. Uh, for health reasons and so on. We don't go out unless we need to. We got brave last Friday, actually, for the first time and drove to Las Vegas for a concert. Ooh. It's the first time my wife has been to Las Vegas since 1995. And we verified that there were probably good reasons not to want to go to Las Vegas on a regular basis. It's way too expensive and too noisy. But the Michael Buble concert was great. Oh, that's awesome. So, so we uh, we had a good time. And, you know, this is the first time that we have made any major trip in, well, almost three years. So it's okay. But we made that choice. And so we don't regret it. And we stay in and do the things that we need to do. And we continue to accomplish and thrive. You know, it, it's good to live a life where you don't feel like you have regrets. Um, you know, and I, I, I tell this to my friend who needs more confidence to, to approach leading socially, you know. What's the point of sitting there and thinking about it? Like, go over and say hello. You're never going to know until you try. And mm -hmm. if worst, worst possible scenario, she tells you to go away. And you can pat yourself on the back because you, you know had the audacity to try in the first place you tried exactly um you know it, it i think it's so important to have goals um and then not be afraid to work really hard and uh a lot of people in this day and age don't might not want to you know put in a lot of effort um but if you do, you know, I think, you know, you can succeed and you can achieve the things that you want. Um, when I was a PhD student and I was thinking about my dissertation, um, I started reading autobiographies written by people with autism. And um, I, I found them to be really, really interesting. And every time I would read a really good publication about autism, it seemed like they always came from Jessica Kingsley Publishers in London. And I used to fantasize as a lowly grad student, well, maybe one day I can publish a book with Jessica Kingsley Publishers. So after graduating and presenting my dissertation successfully, 
Um, I revamped it, pitched it to Jessica Kingsley, um, and my book, Girls with Autism Becoming Women, came out in 2018. So that was a dream come true and a, you know, um, a goal that took a long time to accomplish. Tell us about the book, if you would, please. Absolutely. So my book is comprised of seven autobiographies written by women with autism. Um, I started out looking at, at all autobiographies, but I had way too many. Um, and so I whittled it down to seven American women who wrote autobiographies about their experience with autism and, you know, looked for the themes that emerged, what were, what was difficult, what was helpful, um, and, um, you know, some interesting themes, um, emerged and, um, you know, Girls with autism are diagnosed far less than boys with autism. Um, and I really wanted to bring more attention to that experience. Uh, and, you know, it's really interesting because I, I always say how I, I like to go back and forth between academia and, and practice. Um, so after my book came out, I got divorced and I had to go go to work full time. Um, and so I got a job doing applied behavior analysis therapy for children with autism. And I was hooked up with this two year old little girl. And um, the connection that I made with this with this little girl is profound. And to this day, I still I am very involved um, with her with her with her family. She's a kindergartner now, but when I met her, you know, the book had just came out and I remember trying to get her to take a nap one day and, and I was telling her, like, I wrote the book for you, little girl. Um, and uh, in the field of ABA, they really frown upon forming this type of relationship with a client, um, which is one of the many drawbacks um, of ABA therapy, which is uh, another conversation. But um, my focus and my interest was on this child, her family, and her success. Um, so after doing, working, doing ABA for two years, I left the field. Um, and I think my, my next book could be about, um, could be about ABA there it, it isn't all bad but it needs a lot of attention a lot of regulation um and a lot more oversight than what is currently happening now we so often tend to not acknowledge it seems or recognize the validity of establishing relationships and developing trust um i mentioned I think before we started today that I have interviewed a gentleman, Dr. Yanti Friesen, and he um, talks about universal design learning. And specifically, we talked about how he learned to interact with students and learned that in reality, for uh, a while when he first started teaching, he had a real problem getting students to really interact with him and view him as a positive influence. And one of the reasons was they had another teacher they liked who apparently didn't come back one year and literally two days before school started, he began teaching the, well, he was hired to teach the class. And it took a while to get students to develop a trust in him, but he validates and, and is finding still years later how important it is in all the work that he does that you need to develop that trust in that relationship? I mean, I think the relationship is, is critical and nothing is going to get done without that trust, without building that relationship. And, you know, unfortunately in, in the ABA industry, they miss the forest for the trees yeah. quite often. 
and what you, you know what is difficult for for people with autism well you know socializing and and communication those are challenges and one of the rules of ABA is that you can never eat with your client if they're having dinner and you're there your job is to you know do therapy for the client you may not eat and I'm thinking, what could be more human, more social than sitting down together and eating food, breaking bread? Like, what are you trying to do here? What is the goal? Well, it should be establishing a relationship. It should be bettering all of us. And, and the reality is, I'll bet if you analyze and you probably do this you learn as much or more from persons with autism as they ever learn from you oh absolutely i mean i look forward to the what is it, like four hours a week that i get to spend with this girl and i enjoy it probably more than she does um but you know i i care deeply about this child and her having um, a successful life. And, you know, I know a little bit about it, so I, I can help out. Um, and that is so much more important than uh, this company and their guidelines and their restrictions and everything like that. Um, yeah. How are, things, how are things going with her? She's amazing. Um, I am constantly in awe of this child. Um, and it's so much fun getting her, getting to see her grow up. And, you know, I knew when she was two and a half that she had language. It, she spoke very, very quietly and under her breath, but I knew it was there. And I just put all priority on getting her to talk. I'm like all the other behavioral stuff, whatever, we'll deal with that later. We have this limited time frame where, you know, we're gonna get her talking really fluently. And her she speaks so perfectly. Her grammar, her pronouns, all of the things that are so challenging for people with autism. Here she is in kindergarten, it's all perfect. She is in a mainstream kindergarten. She has a one-on-one -on -one aid. Um, she has friends she uh, she's amazing um and i get to see all these little milestones she was asking me how to spell something and she was holding the the, the paper and she was holding the marker and she asked me uh how do you spell note and i was like oh as in take a note yes and i she looked she looked me right in the eye she says, what's the first letter? I say, N. She looks down and she writes it. Looks, makes eye contact again with me. Did it each time. And I was like, I'm like, where, where are the, the experts who, are, who can enjoy this moment with me? Like, this is so huge. And, you know, she has friends. She um, has interests. She knows she's a great artist. You know, the sky is the limit for this girl. And... So much of it has to do with the fact that she's got the support of family and that she got diagnosed so early. And when I first met the family, um, you know, two and a half, she had just gotten this diagnosis. Um, and it's a lot to handle for the entire family. And, and the grandmother was taking her and, and picking her up. And I could just, she was so upset. This grandmother was so upset just not knowing if she was doing the right thing for her grandbaby, you know, and, and all the other therapists are trying to deal with her. And I was like, listen, I mean, you know, I was like, she just needs to be reassured that what they're doing is the right thing. And I said to her, I was like, listen, I wrote this book. I've done all this research. My research shows that the two biggest factors in having a positive outcome and achieving what you want is family support and early diagnosis. And I was like, so she's two, here you are, you care, mazel tov, you are doing it, you know? And it, it, something changed in her. 
something changed because now she had the confidence and she knew I'm doing the right thing for this, for this granddaughter. Um, and able to galvanize it and, and rally the whole family around this girl, the whole community. And because of that, um, you know, fingers crossed, she can achieve what it is that she wants to achieve. Is she becoming much more socially outgoing then, the girl, little girl? She has always been, and this is really interesting, um, girls with autism are more socially motivated than boys. And I've noticed this in the literature, I've noticed it in the clinic. Um, there are some boys with autism who will be socially motivated. You know, it's not like a rule that they're not. But every female client I had wanted to be around other kids. And she, um, from the time she was three, wanted to be with her friends. And that was the motivating factor. You know, well, if you want to be with your friends, you know, you need to put on your shoes and you can't hit them and, you know, this, that, the other. So let's go be with your friends. And, um, you know, it's getting to be a higher level of friendship for her. So, um, you know, she stepped on her friend's fingers uh, on the playground one day and the friend said, you know, I'm not going to be friends with you anymore. And she thought that was it. It was over, you know, and she was really upset that this friendship should end, you know, um, and like we talked about it and she made a note for the friend and she apologized for the friend to the friend and the friend said, you know, okay, um, so I don't want to draw this beautiful, perfect image because there are challenges and meltdowns. Right and serious setbacks um but she is she is socially motivated many women with autism are socially motivated um out of the seven women in my book um all of the women who wanted to get married did except for one and the one woman was born she was i think the oldest author she was born before any sort of legislation. There was a time where she did not attend school whatsoever because the principal just didn't want her there. And there was no ADA, there was no IDEA, um, there was nothing. So she just didn't go to school. The parents were against her in every way, really just uh, set up obstacles. She met someone um, at some sort of, uh, mental health social event and um, they really liked each other and they got engaged except their family showed up they were at the mall on a date their family showed up and like physically like took them apart and like made every effort so that she could not get married and you know it just it again it it demonstrates that if you don't have the support of your family yeah you know you're, you're, you might be sunk. All too unfortunate. And I think any person with a disability who has grown up with that disability has experienced some of that lack of support. And I think you're absolutely right. There is an incredible correlation between persons who feel positive about themselves and who, in fact, have uh, been successful and the level of support and confidence that they get from their family and, and others around them. I mean, it, you know, being a person with a disability, you are born into a system that was not set up for us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, now hopefully it's being retrofitted and in the future, yeah, we, hopefully we can move toward universal design. And, you know, we're constantly receiving messages, implicit and explicit, about, um, you know, our, our, our ability to belong to the system. Um, you know, do we have a place in this system? And it is difficult to be resilient to a lot of the negative messages telling us, like, you, you know, you're a square trying to fit in a circular peg. Um, and I deal with that often. Um, 
you know, in moments of anxiety, I have this overwhelming feel of wrongness that just, you know, this is wrong and that's wrong and this is wrong. I come out of those moments. Sure. Um, but, you know, it, it's with love and support and, you know, my children and my parents and my friends and my community around me. And I try to, you know, I try to impart some of this to the people around me. I, fi- I figure, you know, um, you know, the Jewish principle of tikkun olam to bring light into the into the world. And if I can, if I can bring a little bit of light, then it's worth it. It's a process, and unfortunately, while we're making some good progress in some ways, we're also seeing some steps backward. In our modern technological world, it's amazing now how much easier it is to make things visual and not worry about other aspects of it. I, I, one of my favorite examples is television commercials. How many today may have music or other things, but there's no dialogue, so you and I can't tell what's going on in the commercials. And for me, the irony of that is that what do a lot of people do when a television show breaks for a commercial? They get up, they go get a drink or a snack or go to the bathroom. And the commercials that aren't providing any audio information are lost on these people. So it isn't just us. Society, though, is excluding us intentionally or not, they are. And it is something that shows up and people accept it. And there isn't that much of a hue and cry yet to deal with it. Um, Yeah, I I agree with that 100%. And I think part of this, uh, this mindset and the, the direction we're going in is, you know, we have these virtual avatars. And you can be anyone you want in, you know, cyberspace. Yep. You can you can be whoever you want to be. Um, and that's fun. But guess what? In real life, it doesn't work that way. Nope. And people talk about, oh, well, you know, I, I, I've been born in the wrong body. Um, well, is there anyone on this planet who feels like they were born into the body they were meant to have? You know, like... I, what are you talking about? Like, I'm supposed to be six foot tall, 120 pounds, blonde hair, blue eyes. Like, that's what I'm supposed to be. That That's ridiculous. And the fact is that, you know, we have these biologies, we have this embodiment. And, if you know, you, you need to make peace with it. You need to become at home in the body you find yourself in. Yeah. And the, the, the 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 process or the mindset where you can just become anyone you want to be i feel is damaging to people with disabilities because it it tells us well if you just wanted to bad enough you can be normal you could be able bodied don't you just want it and get some surgery and and do this and do that and it's setting up a really unfair precedent for us so here's a question if you could get your eyesight fully restored today, would you? Or what are your views on that concept? Oh my gosh, that, oh, you're really cutting to the quick there. Um, <laughs> it, it were like 100% guaranteed. Oh, you yeah. know, why not? Like, wh- sure. I mean, you guarantee it, it's going to happen. Yeah, I would, I'll, I'll, I'll do anything once. Um, See, listen to what you just said, though. You're not desperate to do it. No. Um, people ask me the same question often. And my response is, um, sure, because it would be a new adventure. But do I need to do it? No, I do not. Absolutely. Because I like the person whom I happen to be. Yeah. And if you want to like the person that you are, you need to accept every part of that person. Exactly. And I think when people who don't have disabilities um, look at us and are sometimes envious of our 
positivity or our happiness. And then that makes them even more miserable because they're like, look at this gimp or look at this, you know, crip. And they're a mess, but they're way happier than me and I'm perfect. It's like, well, you know, like maybe you are and maybe you're not. Maybe like, you're not. This is me and this is who I am, you know, take it or leave it. Do you ever get involved with or or do you have much knowledge about any of like the blindness consumer organizations? Do you ever work with them? No, I, I haven't. Um, Just curious. One time, a long time ago, I was in a focus group with blind people for like using a phone. But I think mm -hmm. that was my my greatest. Association. Yeah, right. Because they're there are many blind people who do have a very positive outlook on, on blindness and who truly believe that blindness isn't the problem. It is our misconceptions and that we as blind people can do what we choose to do. And it isn't blindness that defines us. Um, but it is still by any standard an uphill battle to get people to recognize that. Absolutely. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stigma and prejudice and discrimination. And, you know, just today I attended a virtual job fair um, from the state of Illinois for people with disabilities, um, different state agencies that are opening, open to hiring people with disabilities. And, uh, you, you know, a lot of people were asking, well, at what time do you disclose your disability during the interview process? And um, it, it's fascinating because I, one of the things I do is I'm a uh, qualitative research consultant for a company called the Exeter Group. And we lead focus groups consisting of employees with disabilities of a variety of, of healthcare, um, hospitals, companies, organizations. And in every focus group I do, the concept of when to disclose during the job application process is discussed. Mm -hmm. um, and today you know, they told us, they're like, don't tell anyone until you're hired. <laughs> you know? And, and like, see, I totally object to that. And this is what they're telling. This is what the state was telling everyone. Like, unless you need an accommodation, don't tell anyone until, until you have the job. When I first began working, um, well, I worked, I actually worked for the national federation of the blind, um, 1976 to 1978 as part of a project with Ray Kurzweil, the guy who invented the Kurzweil reading machine. And then I went to work for Ray. And after about eight months, I was given a choice uh, because I was doing human factors kinds of, of work in both situations. But I was given a choice of either being laid off or going into sales. And as I love to tell people, so I lowered my standards and I went into sales. But the, um, the, the, the thing I didn't know a lot was about how to sell professionally. So I went through a Dale Carnegie sales course. And the most important thing that I learned from that course by far was a real simple sentence, turned perceived liabilities into assets. And I believe that blindness is clearly a perceived, perceived liabilities and it's one of the greatest assets that I have available to me. And I actually use that concept in preparing some letters for resumes uh, and specifically talking about being blind because as a blind person, I have to sell all the time just to be able to have any chance of being competitive. So do you want to hire me who sells all the time and understands it? Or do you want to just hire somebody who sells for eight or 10 hours a day and then goes home? turn perceived liabilities into assets. So if you want to look at it from a legal standpoint, don't tell anyone until you're hired. That's great. But then what happens when you're hired, all the barriers go up. Whereas if you deal with it up front and create a way to deal with it in such a way that the value you bring can't be disputed, 
it doesn't get any better than that. Right. Um, but, you know, there are huge challenges and, you know, I've been able to accomplish just about everything that I've set out to do in this life. Um, but the only thing that has kind of eluded me so far is um, I wanted to teach at the college level. Um, I want to be a college professor and um, I feel like all doors have been shut to me. There is one blind disability studies um, academic right now, uh, Adrian Ash. Yep. No, I'm sorry, not not Adrian, not, not Adrian. anymore. Georgina no. Cleach. Yeah. And she's the only one. She's, so, not. she's oh, not. She's not. But okay. oh, no, there are a number of of blind people who teach at the college level. Um, people in the past who taught at the college level, Jacobus Tembrook, who founded the National Federation of the Blind, was originally a doctor of psychology at University of California at Berkeley. And then um, he was asked to start the speech department. I think he was asked to start it, um, but he, he took it in a completely different direction. Um, he, when it was formed, he announced, or when he was hired to run it, after teaching psychology at, at the college level at Berkeley for some time, he told all the professors on campus, we'd love to have you join our department, but if you're gonna join our department, what you have to agree to do is to take on a different discipline other than your main original discipline of study. Dr. Tembrook always wanted to be a constitutional law scholar, but Berkeley would not let him do that because they said a blind person could not achieve that and couldn't possibly study to do law. Mm -hmm. So when he announced anyone can join the department, but you have to take on a different discipline other than the original one that you have your degree in, what do you think he went after? And he became one of the foremost constitutional law scholars of the 40s, 50s, and, and up to the mid-60s. But there are a number of blind people teaching at the college level today. And um, so they're, they're out there. Well, I would like to be one of them. Let's let's chat more about that offline because we have to stop because it's been an hour. We've been having fun here, um, but I'd love to chat with you more about that and um, would would be glad to. Awesome. Well, Heather, it has been fun having you on Unstoppable Mindset, and we'll have to definitely have you back on when you're hired to uh, be a, a college professor. But in the meantime, how can people get your book? How can they learn more about you if they want to reach out to you? How do they do that? Well, uh, an easy way to start is just Google me. And my full name is Heather Stone Wodis, W-O-D-I-S. Um, my book, Girls with Autism Becoming Women, is available everywhere and anywhere. Amazon, Google Books, Barnes & Noble. Um, I'm on all the social media platforms. So you can always reach me that way. Um, Facebook is great. And uh, I'm pretty prompt about responding to questions and, and messages. So I look forward to hearing from people. Well, I hope people will reach out and you and I definitely will stay in touch. Great. Thank you so much, Michael. Well, I want to thank you, Heather, for being on Unstoppable Mindset. And all of you listening, we really appreciate you being here. Hope you enjoyed this show. Um, and Heather is certainly as great an example as anyone about how to be unstoppable. Um, everyone can do that. We all underestimate what we're capable of doing. And we need to recognize that we're probably better than we think. And I don't mean that in a, a negative or conceited way, but we underestimate our abilities. So I hope that people will listen to this podcast and recognize that they can probably do better than they are and maybe do more meaningful things. I'd love to hear from you. Please feel free to email me. You can reach out through my email address, which is michaelhi at accessibility.com, M I C H A E L H I at Accessibe, A C C E S S I B E dot com, or you're welcome to visit our podcast page, which is www.michaelhingson, H I N G S O N dot com slash podcast. And definitely wherever you're getting the podcast, please give us a five star rating. We'd love, 
we love to hear comments, but always love the great ratings if you're willing to do that. So again, thanks very much. And Heather, once again, thank you for being with us. Thank you. It's our pleasure.